Lanka and specifically the first obstacle that he encounters along the way. But before we get into that obstacle, let's look at a little broader context of what happens. The Vanaras have been sent on a mission to search for Sita and researching is an experience that we all have at some time or the other. We may search for some object that we may have lost, a key, a phone, sometimes in a community a child may get lost, a child may just while playing walk away or then there is a fear, is the child injured, is the child abducted and then everybody in the community comes together to try to find child is so precious but here the situation is uh, something far more serious Sita has been abducted and I have a friend in California who works in human trafficking one of the scariest, most horrendous things that can happen to people and the first finding out where a person has been taken after abduction is itself extremely difficult and then finding that person and getting them back is another huge challenge in itself. Sita has been abducted and it's been days and months that have passed. Generally whenever any grave event happens, the gravity, the intensity, the emotions associated with that event are there initially for some time. But after that, the humdrum, mundane, routine nature of life starts creeping back in and no matter how grave a thing that has happened, everybody starts acting as if, well, it's happened now, what to do about it, let's move on with life. And at one level it's understandable, the world will not stop because one bad thing has happened. But for those who have been affected by it, it's a an unbearable thing. So, one of the greatest uh, adventures in the Ramayana starts from this backdrop of great agony. When all these Vanaras are summoned by Sugriv to come from various parts of the world, They don't know why they have been summoned. They do know that something serious is up. Their previous king was Wali and Wali had been killed in his own kingdom and Sugriv had now become the king. They knew that there was this rivalry, but there was some animosity between the two brothers and when they came, you know, whenever there is any new, in any play, any setup, if there is any change in the management, and then after that a meeting is called, there is always some nervousness. What, what is this about? When say the government changes in a country or in a state, like after elections, and then a meeting of all the staff is called. Well, who is going to be let off? Who is going to be demoted? Who is going to be promoted? A lot of changes happen. So all the Vanaras, they come promptly and they all want to at one level be in the good books of the new king Sugriva. 
and yet Sugriva does not really know he knows all of these Vanaras he knows that uh, he, has, he has himself travelled across the world primarily with the desire to hide from Bali and because most of the Vanaras were affiliated to Bali at least officially because he was the king so Bali had tried to use them to kill Sugriva and the tensions were huge at that time that would Sugriva treat them with suspicion would Sugriva try to get back at them now that even if they had not assisted him even if they had not tried to attack him but they had not assisted him either so I mean Sugriva came Sugriva called all of them he didn't mention anything about anything from the past he focused simply on one thing he introduced all of them to Lord Ram and he told them that we need to find Sita and in one sense most of the Vanaras felt relieved that none of the politics of the past was going to affect in any way they were all here for a particular mission a particular service and when then then Lord Ram spoke to them and when Ram spoke they could clearly see that he was in great grief in fact unbearable grief yet there was this uh, elegance this uh, refinement, this sublimity to his personality, to his speech, to his conduct. He expressed his gratitude to all of these Vanaras. None of them he knew also, but they had now come and he urged them to go in this go in search of Sita. And yet when they were all going, Sugriva while he was ready to let the past stay in the past he still needed people whom he could count on and while he had been in the forest Jambavan and Hanuman had been with him so he deputed to them the southern direction for going that was the direction in which Sita was most likely to be because they had seen Ravan fly in the southern direction and while the demon could have been just deceiving them by flying in initially in one direction and then another direction but they also had heard from the sages and others that the demon's kingdom was in the southern direction and moreover when the Vanaras had seen him going in the southern direction you know, they had been no threat to him they, he, he had probably not even noticed them so he had no reason to deceive them so Ram and Sugriva conferred and then now for Lord Ram the first person among the Vanaras that he had met was Hanuman so Hanuman was of course from the spiritual perspective Hanuman is a is among the topmost devotees of Lord Ram Shri Ram Dutam Sharanam Prapadde as we say but from the immediate perspective within the Leela Ram is the first person whom Hanuman is sorry Ra, Ra, the first person that Ram has met is Hanuman and that first meeting had itself been very sweet and memorable Hanuman's sweet words, his elegant speech, it had pacified Lord Ram's mind as it was tormented by both separation from Sita and by apprehension about Sita's fate as well as exasperation that they had not been able to find Sita for so long. And then 
Hanuman as the person who had introduced them to Sukhriv. So Lord Ram said, Hanuman, you are most likely to find Sita. And if you find her, give her this signet. The Chuda Mani Darshan Rama. So the Nam Rama is described that. Hanuman was entrusted with this special signet which he was to give to Sita and the leaders of this group Jambavan and Hanuman were both people whom Sugriv trusted and Hanuman also had a special relationship with Ram and yet Sugriv did not appoint either of them as the leader of the group. He appointed Angad as the leader. Angad was the son of the previous king Wali. And though Wali before his death had told Angad don't hold Sugri or Ram responsible for my death. It is because of my own misdeeds that I have been killed and they have just been instruments. So Angad had no bad feelings towards Ram but he still had some reservation about Sugri. Of course, he didn't voice it, and Sugri was aware. Somebody who has had a threat on his life for a long time, and who has somehow survived, you know, has to be both fast on the feet and fast in the thinking. He could he could sense Angad's tension, and therefore he entrusted Angad with the responsibility of being a leader. It was in one way Sugriva's gesture of telling Angad, I trust you. They all knew that the among all the groups going in various directions, the southern group was most likely to find Sita. So to make that group's leader as Angad was Sugriva showing his trust. At the same time, Angad was uh, very young, inexperienced. He was heroic, yet it was a huge, huge responsibility. And the Vanara searched urgently, fervently, desperately. Sugriva had told them to come back within one month. But more than one month had passed and the Vandaras had kept searching, kept searching. And they were torn in two parts. Sometimes if we have to search something and there is a clear cut deadline, say we have to catch a flight and we have forgotten something, we can go home and search for it, but we know okay by this time I have to reach the airport and there is a clear cut deadline, then it's non-negotiable, but say if we are going by a car somewhere, okay I have to find this, we will delay by half an hour, one hour, two hours, three hours, okay, okay. it's our own car, we will go later. So the Vanaras were torn. No, the deadline that Sugriv had given was it a negotiable deadline or non-negotiable deadline they wanted to find Sita desperately so they kept searching kept searching and finally through a series of extraordinary events which they came to the banks of the came to the not the banks the coast of the southern ocean the, uh, southern, uh, the ocean on the southern tip of India. When Sampati told them that I can see Sita in the island of Lanka, 
because I, although my age has afflicted my wings and limbs, it has not affected my eyes. I still have piercing vision. The monkeys jump in joy and they the roaring the charge toward the ocean, delighted that they now knew Sita's location. But when they came there, Suddenly, the celebration just became completely silenced because as they beheld the vastness of the ocean, they started thinking, how are we going to cross this ever? Suddenly joy was replaced by dismay. In a cricket match when a batsman gets out, all the fielding, all the players on the fielding team celebrate. Now they may celebrate but if they see at that moment when one batsman has got out, another batsman is coming in, that batsman is a champion batsman. And okay, one problem is solved but a far bigger problem has come up now. The celebrations become very muted. So like that, they just become somber. And Angad tried to boost the spirits of everyone. He said, Oh Vanaras, all of you are heroic. I'm sure many of you can leap across this ocean and go to Lanka. Sometimes it is stated that the Vanaras or later on Hanuman basically specifically flew to Lanka. It was not flying actually, it was a leaping. It was, it was like a long jump. Hanuman went on top of a later on. He went on top of a mountain and from there he sprang up. So it was a long leap that he had taken. But they were discussing who among them could leap for how long. And they discuss various distances, all the Vanaras said. But none of them was capable of going the entire distance. Jambavan said that when I was young, I could have leapt across the entire earth and gone round it and come back. Nowadays there is this this idea called the flat earth theory. There are so many people, even some devotees, say that the Bhagavatam talks about the flat earth theory. But there are many references about going round the earth. So this one such reference. Jamal said I could have gone round the entire earth. But now, with my age, I don't think I can crawl, I can go even to Lanka. Angad said that, I think if I leap with my full strength, I should be able to go to Lanka. But after that leap, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to come back. Leap all the way back again. It's one thing for the subordinates to admit their inadequacy in front of their leader. But it's another thing for a leader to ad admit their inadequacy in front of the subordinates. And especially somebody who has just become a new leader, who is still trying to establish their credentials in the team. Jambavan was wise and expert, he said. He helped Angad save face. He said, oh Prince, you are our leader and you are the Prince of our dynasty. It does not behoove you to go as a messenger. So 
someone else among us should go they all turned looking at towards each other and they noticed that there's one person who had not spoken till now been sitting silent in a reflective mood hanuman as we know had been blessed soon after his birth with extraordinary powers but in his childhood because of his mischievousness he had been cursed normally the word curse has a certain sense of harshness to it and with that harshness comes the idea of punishment uh hanuman was punished not really he was not punished he was cursed he was cursed for his protection not for his punishment he had ability extraordinary abilities he had been blessed with but along with ability we all need maturity maturity is the ability to use our ability wisely so because he was still a child he didn't have that power maturity and does the say you said that you will lose your power actually you won't lose your power you will lose your remembrance of your powers now it's interesting how Mm. memory works we all know about amnesia by which say somebody is hit on the head and they lose their memory of things now which part of the brain when hit will lo- lead to which kind of memory loss is very difficult to predict the brain brain first of all is very complex and on top of that the memory itself is even more complex hmm. based on the computer metaphor there was the idea that it's like in the computer mem- different data is stored in different parts you know in this area in this particular drive this is stored in this particular folder this is stored the idea was that the brain things are stored like that but as as scientists are studying the brain more and more they understanding that the more we understand about the brain the more we understand how much more there is to understand and now some scientists are suggesting that memory is actually stored not inside the brain cells but somewhere in the magnetic fields in the connection between the brain cells there are many different theories the point i'm making over here is that how memory appears and how memory disappears is still a mystery so the, the sages when they curse hanuman it is a very curious kind of curse that hanuman did not forget anything about his daily activities hmm. hanuman did not even forget about his fighting skills but the special abilities that we had he had he just forgot all about them now there are uh, later retellings of the ramayan which describe how what was hanuman thinking at this time when he was uh, silent he was weighed down by the thought of his of the responsibility that ram had given to him he wanted to fulfill that responsibility and still he just felt that he didn't have that ability hanuman till now in the ramayan has been attractive but he's not been ex- he's, 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 as i said he has very uh, very refined speech very sweet voice very pleasing demeanor but 
it does not seem to have extraordinary power and that's why when sugri was fleeing in fear of ali hanuman didn't intervene hanuman didn't think that he had the power by which he could take on ali so for him in one sense there's no question that he could there's no question that he could cross he could go over to lanka it's not possible and yet something deep within him seemed to be calling him there was something he could do it's like sometimes when we lose something sometimes we lose something because we carelessly kept it somewhere or something important we carelessly just left it somewhere and sometimes we lose something because we have kept it so carefully that even we have maybe we have hidden it so carefully that even now we don't remember where we had hidden it so it's lost not because of carelessness but because of ex- excessive carefulness if it, if i just remember something i'll be able to remember so that's why he was silent there must be something i can do there is something i am missing and it was at that time that jambo and started speaking now the later commentators asked that why is it that jambo one was there throughout in the forest with sugri and hanuman why did jambo one not remind hanuman before this of his prowess so jambavan is also a part of the lord's entourage you I know mean, he is found in, he appears in krishna leela also he is among the few characters vivida is another from ram leela who comes in krishna leela hanuman comes but hanuman is not such a active presence in the bhagavatam at least in the 10th canto so jambavan knew by his devotional connection with the lord that hanuman's powers were meant specifically for ram service hanuman hanuman was a faithful servant of sugriva but hanuman's powers special powers which had been blessed to which he had got by the blessings of the devatas they were not meant for sugriva service they were meant for ram service so those powers came to him at that time i was talking recently with one sila prabhu part disciple senior devotee he said that now when he was distributing books he he was able to distribute books in such a phenomenal way he he thought you know i i have some special power and then as things changed in our movement he decided to he was a living full time in the temple he decided to become a grahastha he had his own bo- job and his business he said oh i distribute books very well i guess i'm good at marketing and he started doing marketing and he said it just didn't work i tried again and again and then it struck me that actually krishna had blessed me with this ability for his service so he lives in florida he said that i decided i'm not going to market anything else so he he actually travel even as a grahastha he travels to various places he distributes books and that's how he has taken care of his entire family also so we have abilities that may come to us from our past karma and those abilities we can use for krishna's service or for our own mundane purposes but there are abilities we get by krishna's mercy specifically by higher intervention and those are meant primarily for the lord's service we can use them for other things if we want but they may just slip away so jambavan started speaking to hanuman and he started speaking to hanuman reminding him of the incidents from his childhood whose memory had become obscured 
and as jam bhavan spoke and he was started speaking he was looking straight ahead at hanuman and as he was speaking hanuman's spirits were rising but along with that his bodily form was also expanding his spirits were expanding his body was expanding so jam bhavan started talking with hanuman looking straight ahead but by the time he finished speaking he was looking way up hanuman had taken on a giant form and this is actually the power of words that words can expand our spirits they can energize us and we all need reminders that there is more to us than what we normally think what the world ascribes to us the spiritual master is like in this case jambavan and that we all have have hidden spiritual potentials that we spend most of our life unaware of that is what the spiritual master tells us <coughs> there are different kinds of friends some people want friends just so that they can brag about their abilities Krishna talks about this in the 16th chapter. The, the demoniac people also want friends, but they don't want friendly friends. They want a fan cl- fan club, where Ishvaro aham aham bhogi siddho aham balwan sukhi, where they want others to be just people who listen to their glories. So, people who simply want to brag about their abilities. they may be friendly but they are not actually friends the real friends are those who remind us of vital truth that we have forgotten who remind us and encourage us and that's why that reminder and encouragement they empower us so hanuman said yes i will jump across to lanka i not only find sita i will find sita fight off the demons and get her back i'll approve lanka and bring it back i'll destroy ravan the terrible demon who had the audacity to abduct mother sita so jambavan had till now been enthusing hanuman and when enthusiasm can go towards over enthusiasm is always an illusive thing so jabba would said okay hanuman we have been told give we have been given one mission find sita just do that and come back and inform ram so hanuman nodded hanuman felt the surge of power envelop his entire being as he remembered the exhilarating adventures of his childhood and he leapt up from the mountain on which he had climbed and he said streaking across the sky the force of his jump was such that it appeared as if a meteor had suddenly appeared in the sky and was streaking across and hanuman was fixed he now had the opportunity to be the single person to fulfill the mission before his lord while he had traveled across the earth with sugri he had never been alone like this long long ago in his childhood he had leapt up high into the sky to go towards the sun thinking it was inevitable but that was just a childish fro childish play a child seeking a toy here was a serious mission 
and he was all alone in this mission he was determined to not let any obstacle come in its way <coughs> and at that very moment suddenly a mountain started appearing through the ocean rising upward 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 and blocking his way so while he felt that the mountain was probably some kind of demon or some kind of obstacle saw this obstacle he was about to hit it and then suddenly he was think i was thinking that how much force do i have to hit it he was thinking of going apart but is this rising upward and blocking his way completely so So when he was just moving forward, suddenly a face appeared on that. Now what was this obstacle? Does anyone know? On the mountain. What was the name of the mountain? Mainak. Mainak. Yes. Thank you. So now Mainak said that actually I am mm, a friend of Dashrath and. who is the father of ram and i am here to assist you i am here to assist you you are going on formidable mission it will be exhausting you already left you have covered quite a distance just i have risen up so that you can rest take some rest rejuvenate recoup rejuvenate yourself and then you can move forward Now, 
This was unexpected. Hanuman realized that this was no enemy. He was just gearing himself up to fight. That was his whole mood. He knew it was going to be an adventure, a fight. And then suddenly, okay, so what did he do? He very politely said to Menak that, I am on a mission to find Sita for Lord Ram. As you know, it's in, we are already late. We can, I cannot wait anymore. I am grateful to you for the service that you offered me. I accept the mood of your service. And Hanuman is going through the sky, just bent down slightly, touched the mountain. That was his way of accepting that offering. And then he moved on. And Mainak looked up at him, smiled and blessed him. She says, may you be successful in your service to Lord Ram. Now this incident just seems to just go by in a moment in the Ramayana. But it has a very great significance. Because what it illustrates is that this print, is this visible there? No. Yeah. How to say no? We all face times in our lives when we have to say no. And how do we go about saying that? So, I'll talk about from Hanuman's actions, three principles. So, generally speaking, when we have to say no, there could be various reasons. So, basically, if I am here and the other person is here and they are offering us something, saying, okay, come on, come for this, do this, do that. So, say, if we are going to a relative's place, we are working in a company and a colleague says, you know, come for a party. And maybe they have their meat over there. They have something which we don't take. Now, from their perspective, it's just a courtesy they're offering. So there could be various reasons. So, that, so from the other person's side, they are inviting, they are offering something. And from our side, we have to be responding. Now, how do we say no? To understand this, let's start by the other extreme of how to not say no. Mm -hmm. So, Generally speaking, whenever somebody is making an offering, mm -hmm. there is the content and there is the intent. That is what somebody is offering and why somebody is offering. Content is more about the what <coughs> and intent is why. So, Krishna goes to Duryodhan with a peace proposal. And when he goes with a peace proposal, what is Duryodhan's response? Do you remember? Sorry? He didn't accept. He didn't accept. Well, that's a extremely polite way of stating what he did. <laughs> what did he say? Do you remember? He wanted Krishna sign him. He wanted? Krishna sign him. Like not Krishna, but Krishna sign him. No, this is later. This is not when Duryodhan came to Krishna. Yeah. It is in Krishna. Just before the war when Krishna came as a peace messenger. Yes, I will not give enough land to even put the tip of a needle through. <laughs> now, if that had been the age of social media, it would have been a viral insta kya dialogue. Hai. <laughs> but what does it mean actually? It is like if say we invite somebody to our home for some program and but they don't want to come. So they make an excuse. Now they are making an excuse. We know that they are making an excuse. And they know that we know that they are making an excuse. <laughs> but still, 
out of politeness they are at least giving some excuse i have to go here i have to do that but suppose they reply even if i die even my dead body will never come to your program <laughs> that is not just a rejection of the invitation of the offer it is a rejection of the person itself it is a kick in the face of the person so so duryodhan's response to krishna's peace proposal hmm, that is a classic example of how not to say no how to never say no that is why because that is the way we are not only rejecting the person rejecting the invitation but we are ruining the relationship with the person hmm. now even if we feel in, in this case krishna's intention was actually to avoid the war but still he didn't accept it now sometimes the specific offering that a person may give may not be suitable early in the ramayana there is the example that when lord ram is in the forest a fisherman comes and he offers fish to ram and now lord ram it is an insult just time the fisher what kind of who do you think i am i am a noble kshatriya i don't eat such food why are you offering this to me it didn't become disgusted he said i accept the spirit of your offering so the lord is bhavagrahi and we also need to be bhavagrahi in this case that when somebody is offering something if somebody is polite somebody is politely offering something we also need to be polite we can't just be disrespectful or dismissive over there so i'll talk about three things how to say no when somebody is being offered act as the acronym will use so a is ap- appreciate the gesture even if that person is inviting us for something which we which have no intention in going to but if that person is inviting appreciate the gesture so in when we start when we start say practicing spiritual life we want to live according to some principles we have some purposes in our life and many of the things that we might have been doing earlier may no longer fit with our present purpose the principles so at that point we may not want to do the things but if we don't appreciate the gesture then all that happens is we just come off as arrogant or rude or fanatical and when that happens we alienate people krishna in the bhagavad gita 1215 says one of the characteristics of his of a devotee that endears him to others is yasman no dvijate loko lokan no dvijate jaya that one who is not agitated by others and one who does not agitate others so yes some some people may offer us in appropriate proposals but that does not mean that we have to just reject those proposals we cannot be disrespectful <laughs> This is one of the lessons which I learned when I started coming to America, North America, basically to America, and started doing Western outreach. Mm-hmm. Once I had been to a college program, and this is Western or Western college program, so there was one American girl. She asked a question about why do religions fight among each other? And I explained elaborately based on the three modes how the tam- tamaguna is the characteristic of every group of people. There are some people with tamas. Anyway, I elaborately answered the question. and then mm, so i could see she was quite relieved by that after the class she came and talked with me no this question has been burning me for so long this was a big obstacle for me in my spiritual journey now whichever i had gone to various groups the answer they were giving is uh, you know yeah you know our group is not fanatical other religions are fanatical but you gave me an objective criteria so the in satvarajastamas has got nothing to do with hinduism christianity islam 
Mm. That is, Tamasic people can be in any religious group. Mm. And Sattvic people can also be in any religious group. Anyway, so she, she says, it's such a non sectarian answer, but at the same time, it, was, it gave me some objective criteria. I'm so grateful. And he says, I'm so grateful. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> so now, um, as a brahmachari, I couldn't accept that. So then I just turned to the devotee who was next to me. And I said, to him, please help me. And then he helped me. He was, a, he was a youth preacher organizing the program over there. He helped me in a completely unexpected way. He said, he's a monk. On his behalf, you can hug me. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife was there next to him. <laughs> and she said, I am his wife. On his behalf, you can hug me. <laughs> so... <laughs> And the two of them hugged each other. So that <laughs> this is protection through parampara. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the point I was making is that in Indian culture, the gender interactions are in a particular way. And of course, that is also changing in India to some extent. But those particular gender interactions are not the same in the Western world. And from her perspective, she was just expressing her appreciation. So, we need to appreciate the gesture. Although, the, we may not be able to reciprocate with that gesture. Maybe it's not appropriate for us to. But the point is, appreciate the gesture. So, Hanuman did not say, you know, why are you coming in my way? Just get out of my way, I have to go now. Hmm. Hmm. Then, after appreciating the gesture, the next part is, communicate our purpose. Mm. or in this case principles mm. meaning how do we we need to okay if you are not going to say yes if you have to say no how do we say no mm. here it's best that we do it non-judgmentally so if somebody say invites us to go for a movie and we say okay I am not interested in watching movies mm. if somebody invites us to a place where say the meat is being eaten and we mean and we say, I don't want to go there. Now so, what, so there are two ways when we have to convey communicate our purpose or our principles. So when we communicate our principles, we could do it in a prescriptive way or we could do it in a descriptive way. So prescriptive means you do it. So for example in even outreach, the kind of outreach that works and the kind of outreach does not work. That say, especially now the time we are living in is the postmodern times, and people value experience a lot. They suppose you know, I was at an interfaith conference and there was one Christian priest who was telling me how they have to be they have to change the way they communicate with the younger generation. They say maybe one or two generations ago. Say, if a couple wanted to separate, the first thing you tell them is that you know, divorce is a sin against God. You will go to hell. He said that today, if you tell that to a young couple, they will say, divorce is a sin against God, you will go to hell. He says, you go to hell right now. I don't care for you. So the way we will communicate that is, you know, that, okay, you know, everybody has some difficulties. You know, we have been, this was a Protestant tradition. Protestant, they don't have any, uh, any monks, so they have most married priests. He said that then we will come you know, I've been married for 25 years. And this is how I made it work. And I would like to share some things with you, some difficulties we had and how we overcame them. So what happens is what descriptive means basically two things. What we do and why we do. So instead of prescriptive means you should do this. So once we go in this direction of you should do this, people start thinking, who are you to tell me what I should do and what I should not do? So this is our purpose. We say this is not my purpose, this is not my principle, the scriptural principle, the universal principles. Okay, they may be universal, but people have not taken those leaps of faith by which they have accepted the authority of scripture, right? So we need to think of ways in which we can communicate our purpose 
in a way that makes sense to others. So that's why whenever we are talking about our purpose, our principles, there are two ways to explain it. One is scriptural and the other is logical. That now, as I said, scripture is a something which whose authority they may not have accepted. So why don't you, suppose somebody offers us meat, why don't you eat meat? Oh, no, meat eating is sinful, it is one of the four pillars of Madharma. You will caught, get caught by Kali and you will be entrapped and you will suffer. No, that all may be true, but that explanation doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So, the logical explanation would be that what do I do? Why do I do it? You know, when I came to know how much violence is involved in the meatpacking industry, how much pain the animals go through, I decided I really don't want to be a part of all this. I don't need to have this food when it's going to cause so much pain to so many life forms. Or you could talk about when I came to know about the health benefits or of vegetarian food or whatever. Speak in a way that they can understand. So we need to communicate our purpose. If we don't do that, and all that happens is we alienate the person. So generally speaking, whenever there is any kind of interaction with anyone else, we need to see that that interaction is an opportunity to help that person grow in some way spiritually. It could be, need not be directly a spiritual interaction also. But just if they start feeling, okay, this seems to be, this person is intelligent, this person, what they say makes sense, then that itself will help them grow in their spiritual journey. So communicate our purpose. Communicate it in a way that the other person can understand. So, when we do that, the focus is not getting them to do what we are trying to do. When there is communication, there are various levels of communication. This itself is a various different subject. At the very least, what we do, we make it intelligible to the other person. Hmm? Intelligible means, yeah, I may not agree with it, but okay, I understand where you are coming from. Above intelligible at the top level could be adoptable. Oh, I also want to do this. Now, that, if they do that, that's wonderful. But we cannot expect that to happen automatically. Mm -hmm. What would be? What would be undesirable is that we come off as irrational, fanatical, judgmental. Mm -hmm. That is what we don't want. Mm -hmm. So, all of this is good. So, communicate our purpose in a way that the other person can understand. So, I gave a whole background to the story of this particular incident. Because now, for Hanuman, the weight of responsibility, the joy of opportunity that had was there, was all there for him. For Menak, Hanuman communicated that I cannot wait. I am grateful for the service that you are offering. But I cannot wait, it's extremely urgent. I have to go right now. So that is communicate. So what is the acronym we were discussing? Ah, yes. So the so D is hmm, this thank in an appropriate way. So appreciate the gesture also means that we don't have to ascribe ulterior motives to the other person. Like say somebody may offer us something which will be against our principles. But that does not necessarily mean that they are trying to tempt us or deviate us. They, let's us that they are, ex, they are offering it with good intention. So now how can we thank in an appropriate way? Shri Prabhupada himself you know, was extremely aware and grateful for everyone who had done any service. During Prabhupada's time, there was a famous musician, George Harrison. And he chanted Hare Krishna and he, 
inspired thousands and thousands of people to chant Hare Krishna. In fact, in that generation, most people who were introduced to the chanting of the holy names, they were introduced through George Harrison's song like My Sweet Lord and others. Now, what had happened was, he had heard the Hare Krishna Mahamantra before he met the devotees also. And he had thought it was some mystical chant from the East. And he just started liking it, he started singing it. But he had no idea what it was. There was no internet, there was no Google, there was no chat GPT at that time. So there's no one he could ask also. So, this was the 1960s. And now, a lot of Indian immigrants all over the world. Mm -hmm. But in the 1960s, there were very few Indians in UK. He was in UK at that time. And even those Indians who were there in UK, they were not interested in Indian religion. They often used to hide it their religion. So, he, there's no one he could ask. So, when he met Prabhupada's disciples for the first time, Shamsundar Prabhupada and others, he was delighted. And then he met Prabhupada. And at that time, the idea of practicing bhakti was if you have to practice bhakti, you just move into the temple. You start living full time in the temple, that is practicing bhakti. Now, Prabhupada told him that you are a musician. That is, Krishna has gifted you with musical ability. You just make songs about Krishna. And he started doing that. So, Prabhupada didn't tell him to move to the temple. Prabhupada didn't tell him to get initiated. Just Prabhupada said, what ability you have, use in Krishna's service. But then, something happened and everything seemed to be falling apart. Mm. Yeah, in New York, here in Madison Square, he did a performance. And thousands and thousands of fans had assembled. And he would ask them, chant Hare Krishna. And all that happened was, the fans, they started booing at him, throwing bottles at him. You know, people started saying that. Oh, George Harrison was such a great talent and he got mixed with the Hare Krishnas and the world has lost a great talent because of this cult. And then he met Prabhupada again and he said to Prabhupada that, that you told me to write songs about Krishna and that will attract people but I feel as if for every one person that I am attracting there are ten people I am drawing away from Krishna. Now to understand what's ha what is happening, say, mm, mm, suppose there's a World Cup, World Cr Cricket Cup, World Cup finals. Mm. In the last World Cup, India came to the finals, but India lost in the finals. It was very disappointing for everyone in India, all Indians everywhere. But anyway, say suppose some top player like Virat Kohli or Rohit Sharma or somebody, somebody, that person was a devotee. Mm. And in the post-match conference, mm, I ask you, know, what happened? Why did India lose? At that time, say the cricketer replies, Virat Kohli replies, you know, actually winning, losing, it's all temporary. We should just chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Now, the philosophy is perfectly right. But, the timing of telling it is perfectly terrible. See it? Why? Because if you are a cricketer, you are paid to be a cricketer, then people expect you to perform as a cricketer. Hmm? People are not coming to a cricketer and expecting to get a preacher. Isn't it? Hmm. Suppose uh, a loud one in our family has got a heart attack. And we take him to a devotee doctor. And somehow something goes wrong and they pass away. And he says, what happened? You know, whatever happened, life is temporary. Just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> no. You know, if I had to chant Hare Krishna, I would not have admitted him in the hospital. See, if we are in a particular role, we have to do that role properly. Our spirituality can be in addition to that role. Mm -hmm. If we have a heart surgeon, uh, we may want that heart surgeon to, if that's the devotee, well and good. But you know, if I got a heart surgeon to be done, I want to know whether you are a good heart surgeon. If you are a good devotee, that's wonderful. But in a particular role, the particular responsibility expectation that is there, that is primary. And then our devotion, our spirituality can be secondary. So, what had happened was, George Harrison, people would come to him for his musical concerts and the people who would come, they had a particular set of expectations from him. And when he would just tell them to chant Hare Krishna, 
people were enraged by it. So Prabhupada told him, use your intelligence. You know, use your intelligence about how you can attract Krishna, attract people towards Krishna. And then after that again, he started writing the normal kind of songs which he was writing before. And he started concealing or at least downplaying his connection with the Hare Krishnas. And the newspaper said, oh, George Harrison is back. He has been freed from the grips of this terrible cult. And he is composing. But then, discreetly, he would bring in Hare Krishna songs. And people would still appreciate that because they were giving, he was giving music at that time. So, now Prabhupada, and so many people thought that, oh, Hare, George Harrison had become a devotee and then he gave a practice of bhakti. And he went away. But Prabhupada did not see it that way. What Prabhupada saw was, when he was in his final days in 1977, now Prabhupada, one devotee had given him a necklace, Prabhupada took out that necklace and he said, give this to George Harris. He's a very good boy. And so Prabhupada, in his final days, he remembered the service that he had done. So, now would Prabhupada have appreciated the, as many of the songs that he made was mundane songs. Would Prabhupada have appreciated the mundane songs? Well, Prabhupada would not want those mundane songs to be sung in our temples. Obviously not. But that does not mean if that's your profession, you do that. So Prabhupada found the right way to thank him. Now, Prabhupada is the guru, he is giving Krishna to everyone. But this George Harrison, in his position, he had taken a risk. He had got pushback for it. But then he had found the right way to continue service. So, when the, we need to, whenever somebody makes an offering, to thank in an appropriate way. May not entire, accept the entire offering. But whatever it is, thank in an appropriate way. So for Mainak, how did he thank? He th uh, Manuman thank by just bending down, touching Mainak. And Mainak said that this was a test for you and you have passed the test with flying colors. May you be blessed. So generally, if you see, this is the last part I'll conclude with, that in, the ch in chapter 12 of the Bhagavad Gita, hmm, chapters verses 13 to 20, Krishna talks about devotion, devotional qualities. But he talks about it in a very specific way. He is not talking about qualities, he is more talking about qualities that endear a devotee to him. So it's interesting, the qualities that he talks about are not that my devotee fasts or ikadish. My devotee chants 16 rounds. My devotee does puja every day. My devotee worships Shaligram. There is not a single devotional quality mentioned over there. What do you mean devotional? In the sense of quality associated with the direct devotional act. Krishna has mentioned that earlier. The ninth chapter is mentioned Manmana, Bhavamad, Bhakto, Satatam, Kirta, Yanto, Maam. All those qualities are there. But here, Krishna is talking about behavioral qualities. Behavioral qualities means how does a devotee behave with others? So, Krishna is talking about a devotee is forgiving, a devotee is kind, a devotee is compassionate, a devotee is non-agitating. So, these are basically human qualities. Human qualities, sattvic qualities. So, any, guy, any person who becomes a devotee is glorious. But if devotees are in Rajoguna or Tamoguna, then what happens is, they may be connected with Krishna. They may be going toward Krishna, but in their going toward Krishna, by their behavior, they are kicking people away from Krishna. So, when somebody is in Tamoguna, see, men, mm, most of us, we have heard this, kind of fanatics, religious fanatics. So, basically, this is, Fanaticism is the result of Rajoguna and Tamoguna. The fanaticism can be in words or it can be in deeds, in actions. Those who are fanatics in words are called exclusivists. That means we have exclusive right to God. So, with respect to theology, this comes in the Abrahamic religions. That Jesus is the only way. Or say Muhammad is the only way. Uh, their idea is, we alone have right to God. 
anybody who is not following our way that person is going to go to hell they are exclusivists but there are also extremists now extremists are actually much kinder than exclusivists they say anyway you are going to go to hell so why delay it we will help you get there right away <laughs> so these are extremists but both are fanatics and it's easy to laugh at others now these people are so ex exclusive so intolerant they are fanatical in the vedic tradition there was very little theological exclusivism but there was a lot of ritual exclusivism ritual exclusivism means you know if you eat food with not this hand but that hand if you do this with like this if you touch it with like this if you do this if you don't do this then you are a fallen person you are a sinful person you are a dirty person and that was used to look down at others and this is how the caste system which was varanashram originally as a as a system of socio socio occupational engagement this division of labor according to nature that became a very judgmental and discriminatory system so for us also it is important that we don't in the name of our devotion ever start looking down at others we don't we, we don't become judgmental so anybody who is offering anything anybody who is trying to do something you know, thank in an appropriate way we may have certain principles but we don't have to look down on other uh, others because they may not be following their principles i was just a few months ago in nit raurkela raurkela is in orissa not very far from jagannath puri i had a college seminar over there concluding this incident so i was there and there they said uh, there was almost several several more than several thousand some few thousand students were there for the program and after that they had a it was a one time program in the college and then they, behind there was a guest room and then the students were coming in meeting and many students came and met and talked and there was one boy who was standing outside so you have some questions please come in he says can i come in i said what do you mean he was looking a little embarrassed and he wanted to say that one of the boys who was there with me he said that you know he is from an untouchable family so i was a little taken aback i immediately got up and pulled him over into a hug and i told her brother you take a selfie with us <laughs> and now you know this is something from a very previous era but then after that he was talking with me he said that and then some of the boys were talking with me at that time they said that you know when we go to the puri temple or when we go to any temple you know, the the priests are always just asking us for money mm, they are just uh, they just asking us for money asking us for this asking us for that and he says when we go to a church the priests there are so warm and welcoming and polite and they don't discriminate against us at all so say that so don't them it's unfortunate but this is not actually whoever you encountered they are not really representative of sanatan dharma this is not the teaching of the bhagavad gita pandita samadarshita is somebody the really spiritual person they will not be discriminating like this they will not be judging and looking down at people so the point is that different people may come from different backgrounds and say for example the temple we may have our standards so somebody comes and offers food to the deities we may say okay we not we may not offer food directly to the altar to the deities if it is not cooked by people with particular standards but by saying no we don't have to look down at the people we need to be polite you need to thank people in an appropriate way so we may not take the food we may not offer the food to deities but we can accept the food we can distribute it to others respectfully appropriately so if we are not courteous if we are not grateful then we will end up alienating people like i said we may be going toward krishna but we will be kicking others away from krishna but what we should be doing is we are going toward krishna and along with us if we are at least sattvic in our behavior they will inspire others also to come toward krishna maybe not at the same pace as we are going but even if it is a slower pace they will keep moving forward so that is the way 
to say a respectful no. We may say no to the specific offering, but we don't say no to the person's heart. We don't say no to the person's intent. And that's how we can, in following the footsteps of our Lord, we can also be bhavagrahi. So I'll summarize what we discussed. I talked about how to say no. That was the topic. I went into elaborate background to illustrate, first of all, the, the gravity of Hanuman's mission. Hmm. That Hanuman could have had every reason to just cursorily say no. Why was the gravity of uh, the gravity of Hanuman's mission was there? First of all, because there was hmm, there was an urgency to the search itself. Hmm. Sita had been lost for a long time. Then there was the dynamics among the Vanaras, how they had been entrusted, hmm? how they had been entrusted that particular mission and among all the Vanaras, Ram had, uh, Ram had specifically selected Hanuman and given him the signet and then he had just remembered and regained his powers. So the child Hanuman had been very indiscriminate in using his powers. He had been, we discussed how every many people may have ability, but maturity is, then you remember what I mentioned about maturity? Maturity and ability, what is the relationship? Maturity is the ability to use ability wisely. Hanuman had ability in his childhood also, but the childhood, childhood energy, childishness was there. So the test that the curse had worked was that here Hanuman could have smashed the mountain out of the way. The child Hanuman would have done that in his childhood exuberance, but he did not do that over there. So curse can be for punishment. But curse can also be for protection. Protection and transformation. So that was the reason why Hanuman was cursed. And we discussed how through all this Hanuman's grave mission was there. But when he came to Mainak, he said, no, there is a respectful refusal. And we discussed three parts of a respectful refusal. What are three parts anyone remember? A, A, C, D. A was? Appreciate the gesture. That even if that person is offering something with a, with, that is inappropriate for us, but still we need to appreciate that person is offering something. And C was? Communicate. What? Communicate our purpose or principles. Hmm? And how do we communicate them? Polite. Politely, non-judgmentally. Especially, politely I meant here descriptively, not prescriptively. That, that, you know, just tell why, what are we doing and why are we doing it. And last T was? Thank. 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 Thank in an appropriate way. Thank in an appropriate way. So, now, in one sense, appreciate and thank might seem redundant, the same thing, but no. Appreciate is internally, what is the attitude of the look? This is just an interruption. Why is this person interrupting? Why is this person deviating? No. First, we have an internal attitude of appreciation. Hmm? So, this is more of our thoughts. Appreciate. Communicate is words. And then thank is, in an appropriate way, this is more in terms of actions. So, when we do it in this way, then, although the person uh, although we may say no to the specific thing, we will not be saying no to the person's offering. So we are going toward Krishna, but we want to ensure that we are not kicking people away from Krishna by our no. So pushing people away, that is not the way we should be saying no. Rather, what we should be doing is drawing them toward Krishna slowly, even drawing at their pace. At least, we said that, what we saying? 
at least becomes intelligible to them. It may not be adoptable, but at least intelligible. Okay, I understand why you are saying this. So that way what happens? I talk about three like intelligible, adoptable, and then irrational. So if we just keep explain only based on scripture, hmm, then it may just seem irrational to them. So we try to, whatever we are communicating, we try to communicate in a way that it is intelligible or even adoptable. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. So, how do you differentiate between appreciation and thankfulness? I said appreciation is more of in terms of our inner attitude. No, we don't have to go to that person with suspicion. Mm, thinking that, oh, oh, this person is trying to deviate me. I am following principle, this person is trying to deviate me. Say if you are fasting on Ekadash. Say if you have, suppose we are fasting Nirjal. And somebody offers us food. No. Now we may not want to take the food. But we, are not, we shouldn't be thinking that, oh, this person is trying to break my fast. Well, maybe it is like that, but we don't have to start with that assumption. Generally, whenever any person is doing an action, which it may be inappropriate, and we try to ascribe some motive to that person. Mm -hmm. So, let's start with the least negative motive, or the most positive motive. And this person is just out of service attitude to offering me food. Because, oh, this person doesn't, doesn't like it. This person can't perform austerity, so I does not me to perform austerity. And that's why it's tricking me into breaking my past. You don't have to go in that direction. So in our hearts, in one sense, gratitude means to see that anyone who is doing anything for us, that person is actually being kind to us. Now when Prabhupada was in... You can sit down, please be comfortable. So when Prabhupada was in the Jaladuta going to America, at that time, in his he wrote his diary, and then he says, I thank Lord Krishna from within my heart. I thank Lord Krishna for enlightening Sumti Moraji. She was the person who had sponsored his uh, trip. So she had a cargo ship and that she had a cabin. And Prabhupada was living in that cabin. He, says, uh, he said, I thank Lord Krishna for enlightening Sumti Moraji from within her heart to make all these arrangements for me. So she had arranged vegetarian food for him. Now, most of the fish... The, the crew they used to eat meat but she had told Captain Pandya that take abandoned vegetarian supply for Swamiji so Prabhupada was appreciating that now did he specifically thank her for that you know later on when he came to America he was writing letters to her telling how his mission is going so in that sense he was telling her that what you have done it's work it's, we are trying to make it work so the appreciation is he, this particular thing which he wrote in his journal he did not tell it to her so have an appreciative attitude when people are offering anything. Okay? Thank you. Any last question before we stop? So thank you very much. Ramachandra Bhagavan ki Srila Prabhupada ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki Gaur Prabhupada Thank <laughs> you.